Our next speaker is uh, Sochi Nakayama. Dr. Nakayama is Deputy Director of the Japan Environment and Children's Study Program, and he's a big believer in the power of human biomonitoring. Unfortunately, we were not able to establish a stable line to Japan, so uh, Sochi volunteered to have his uh, talk recorded. So we will now have the recorded talk from Dr. Sochi Nakayama. Thank you. In 1975 in the United States. This graph stops in 2009, but we know it's still increasing. The surge is almost 54. On this, sorry. Uh, this uh, this presentation could not be observed Hello, in live stream. First so of all, trying to I'd restart like to the presentation to make it available also for the online viewers. So for the online viewers, we here at the location saw the slides, but it could not be seen to you. Sorry for that. Hello, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank the conference organizers and session chair for giving me such a wonderful opportunity to present our work here. Today, I'd like to talk about human biomonitoring in cohort studies and its implications to public health. You may or may not agree, but our future is in peril. This striking Nature News article shows a sharp rise in the number of autism diagnoses in the past four decades. As you can see here, the prevalence of autism was 1 in 5,000 in 1975 in the United States. This graph stops in 2009, but we know it's still increasing. The surge is almost 50 folds in the last 40 years. So, what is happening? It is estimated that almost half of the reason for this sharp rise is unknown. Pediatricians are suspecting this is due to the environment. As many of you know, we are conducting a nationwide birth cohort study, namely Japan Environment and Children's Study, JECS in short. We recruited 103,000 pregnant women during 2011 to early 2014, and we follow children born to those mothers for 13 years. Of course, we're doing all our best to continue the study. The eldest children are now aged 9 and the youngest is 5. The goal of this study is to identify environmental factors that influence children's health and development. In this slide, I summarized biomonitoring in our study. We analyzed all of the maternal blood samples for metallic elements such as mercury, lead, cadmium, manganese and selenium. We also measured those elements in cold blood. Cotton as a tobacco biomarker was measured in all of the maternal urine samples. Other analytes are listed here including PFAS, organophosphate pesticide metabolites, and environmental phenols such as parabens, bisphenols, and triclosan, as well as phthalates and neonicotinoid insecticides. Measurements of arsenic species in urine, pops in serum, PFAS in cold blood, and AHR receptor binding assay are ongoing projects. We've also measured ambient air pollutants and collected hot dust samples, their home visits when children were at ages of one and a half and three years, VOCs, gaseous pollutants, and particulate matters were determined using diffusion samples and act pumps. We are planning to deploy personal samples to be worn by children when they become 10 years old. Baby teeth will be collected in jacks. We aim to collect 
thirty to forty thousand baby teeth samples in the next four years. We will start collecting and analyzing teeth samples next year under the technology transfer agreement with Dr. Manish Aurora's group. Here I show you one of the public health implications of our study using PFAS, the forever chemicals, as an example. Taking PFNA, median plasma concentration of PFNA injects mothers was 1.4 nanograms per mil. According to the one et al.'s report, children had 2.1 points lower verbal IQ per one low to maternal serum PFNA concentration increase. We had about 1 million births in 2014 in Japan. This is a very rough calculation, but we can associate the maternal PFNA concentration to a total of 893,000 IQ loss. If we can decrease the maternal PFNA concentrations by 1 nanogram per mil, we can save 224,000 IQ loss. This corresponds to 25.6 billion US dollars worth of money. NHANES data shows us that adult women serum PFNA in the US topped in 2009 with median concentration of 1.15 nanograms per mil and then declined to 0.5 nanogram per mil in 2016. So, one nanogram per mil decrease is not unrealistic. HBM tells us about these things. Is this happening only in Japan? No, it's happening worldwide. This is an estimate by Leo Trasandis group in New York University. They estimated in the US $340 billion annually is lost due to the exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals. This corresponds to 2.33% of the GDP. The most affected is the neurological system. The second is reproductive health. Because this is the US estimates, the frame retardants are the most influential chemicals. They also did the same calculation for EU and concluded their loss was 157 billion euros, which is equivalent to 1.25% of the GDP. The same thing is happening all over the world. This is the most important message I want to deliver today. A graph on the top illustrates an HBM distribution of the chemical substance in a certain population. The compound may have the health-based guidance value, for example, HBM2. We use this information to determine a subgroup or s individuals that are at risk and need an action to reduce exposure. What about people on the left side of the guidance value? They don't need any action? Taking an idea of environmental burden, it will be more beneficial and efficient when we decrease every single one's exposure. If we can shift the exposure distribution slightly, just only slightly to the left, we can improve the health of the population and that could give us a huge public health and economic gain as a society. We, as public health professionals, often call this a population approach in contrast to a high-risk group approach. HBM and cohort studies can contribute to the better population approach. With that said, I'd like to conclude my presentation and your questions and comments are welcome. Thank you.